Welcome everybody to today's Flash webinar. Uh, we at Inner Drive love doing these sort of Flash webinars at the last minute. Uh, we like to make them short and punchy and hopefully make it bite-size uh, CPD. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Bradley. Uh, I'm a psychologist uh, at Inner Drive uh, and I'm delighted to be hosting uh, tonight's uh, presentation, um, mainly led by uh, Katie. Um, Katie, uh, for those who aren't familiar with you already, uh, would you like to give us a nice 30 second bio of who you are and, and what you do? Yeah, hi, I'm Katie and I'm secondary PE teacher and assistant faculty leader in PE and faculty research lead. Uh, it's the faculty research lead that led me to the role um, around what I'm going to be talking about today, around independent learning and maximising revision. Um, it's something that I'm extremely passionate about and hopefully that you're going to be able to take something away from um, today's session that is going to help you and your students. Amazing. Uh, I'm so exciting. So I know you and I have spoken before, Katie, so I'm really looking forward to this presentation. We're going to look at four different strategies that you guys at your school try and help your students develop for their revision. Before we jump into talking about what the strategies are, I thought it might be handy just to take one or two minutes. I know we've mentioned in the past, you Tommy, you guys don't see this just about being revision at the last minute. This is about long term uh, and learning. Uh, so you guys actually start this quite early don't you with your students these sort of areas yeah so um we have actually started to embed um revision through a tutor time curriculum which starts in year seven um as soon as they start secondary school revision isn't something that students should be doing when they a few months before the GCSEs or the real levels and um, it's something that needs to be embedded throughout and that's what we do with our tutor time program which is launched in the last two years but really sort of got off the ground in the last year um, running through all our years at school and we do focus on four core revision strategies in which we embed from year seven onwards with the hope that when they get to year 10 and 11 and they are sitting their exams they are um, able to use effective strategies um, that are going to help them prepare for success yeah it's an interesting one isn't it because things always become more prominent the nearer it gets to exams but I always think if we're only introducing students to these concepts now they've got so much else going on with the stress of the exams that it can be quite overloading to introduce new concepts so I'm guessing that was part of the thinking yeah and and you always hear students go oh why didn't I do this earlier definitely when it comes to flashcards oh why didn't I make these last year when my teacher taught me it and it's really sort of getting the students to understand why it's important to start earlier and hopefully by embedding that from year seven we're delivering that message to our students and I know it's probably a bit you're probably going to say it's probably too early to tell because we haven't had the exam results yet and even when you do it's sometimes hard to do cause and effect but your general feeling kind of now that we're only like a month away from exams, do you feel that the students have benefited from this program? Like is their general outlook and approach, do you feel like it's different so far this year as a result? Yeah, and we have recently just conducted a student survey in which we got over 1,100 students responding to it. Um, and that was just re four really simple questions. But just to actually get a gist of, can our students recognise these effective strategies? Because this is what I've been speaking to them about for the last year. Can they actually articulate that and select those? Um, and that was one of the questions that we asked. Can you select the, the four most effective strategies? And we threw in there the ineffective strategies as well. Yeah. So we put in there rereading and highlighting just to check. And over three quarters of the students that responded to the questionnaire selected the four effective strategies, which shows us that within just a year, it has had quite a good impact. And now it's moving forward. How do we maintain that and almost get it to everyone in the school does that? And that we're not selecting those ineffective ones because there was students that still have, have selected the ineffective ones um, and, and there will be but um, it's definitely had impact this year around students feeling more confident on how to use these strategies as well. Yeah and I guess one final question then we will jump into the four different strategies. I imagine if you guys weave this into your tutor time um, you must have to have quite a lot of buy-in and support from senior leaders it to become like a whole school approach as opposed to being just something that some people do within the school yeah definitely and it it started a couple of years ago when I came up with the idea of actually 
when when do we see the students so frequently and when can we get this message across to them consistently and tutors see their students every day they are the most familiar member of staff to to the students and one thing that we have done with the sessions that we deliver is they're all voice recorded so i've re right. voice recorded all of the powerpoints that are delivered during tutor time so that the message is consistent and um, there has been a lot of buying from staff because there's no ownership on them they don't right. need to plan anything. They don't need to learn anything. They just need to hit play and pause every now and again to, to do the activities. So it does make sure that the students are getting a consistent message, which is really important because it's it's easy to misinterpret these things and give different ways of using flashcards, et cetera. So if students are having that consistent message, that's already increasing the effectiveness of the strategies that they're using. Makes total sense. Let's dive straight in. So you guys uh, have looked at four main areas, um, four strategies in the sense that you want your students to become really confident in. Uh, these are about flashcards, uh, the use of mind maps. Uh, you also talk to them quite a bit, I believe, about self-quizzing. Uh, and then finally, we have brain dumps. Uh, we're going to spend a couple minutes on each one. Uh, I know you've developed a sort of a five-step process uh, for each of these. Um, so over to you let's talk about what you do for them for flashcards yeah so for every strategy that you that i talk through today you will see the same layout and it's clear and it's concise because both staff and students use this so we um, make this known and seen to students throughout um, lesson time tutor time and um, it's on posters etc because we want them to be able to have a consistent and have 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 a consistent message around how we're using these strategies but also for them to be simple to follow so that if students want to do them at home it's almost like an instruction sheet it's a guide right. to how to do it and um, and it's simple, so there's not lots of writing, and it's a step-by-step -step method which will allow students to be able to do it effectively. And um, they all start off with the identifying the knowledge, um, and I'm not going to talk about all five areas because I could be here all night talking about <laughs> it, but I am going to zoom in on, on some of the areas that I do think are most important when using this method. So for flashcards, for example, it really does come around the designing of the flashcard and the use of the flashcard. You often see students spending so long making these lovely looking flashcards. They've got colour on it, they're highlighted, they've got bags of information on it. But actually, that's the most ineffective way to make a flashcard. Your flashcard needs to be clear and concise. It needs to have a question on it in black pen. You know, we don't need to highlight it. The questions on one side and the answers on the other side so that our, our brain can process that answer quickly so that we can retrieve it um, quickly and we can understand it. We're not not spending five minutes going oh let me just read through this information and check that I did say that I did get the right answer it's really quick for us to to be able to process and that's one of the the key things that we need to make sure we're pushing when we're making flashcards and that we're not just telling the students to do this we're modeling to students as well so for my year 10s at the start of the course I provide them with the flashcards so I right. model to them what they should look like so that when I ask them to create it, they've seen what a good one looks like and they're not going to go and waste half an hour making five class flashcards that can be made in five minutes. Um, because time's precious for everyone, not just us, for students as well. So we want to be making the most of their time too. And so on that note, so one of the things that I have seen in the past with flashcards when they're, I think they're really good, but when I've seen them used badly, is mm -hmm. students spend so long writing the questions they don't actually spend much time retrieving the answers. One hundred percent. I love it. Yeah. So, like, do you guys provide the questions for them, or do you get students to generate their own questions? Yeah, sometimes. So, like I said, at the start of the course, I will provide questions for the students, and we give our students knowledge organisers at the start of every new topic, um, and it's quite easy to determine questions from the knowledge organiser. It's definitely um, what we might do is give the students five questions and then they take those questions and make them into flashcards instead of making the flashcards for them so that they can go and find the answer themselves to put it on there. Because like you say, they're spending far too long making them and actually making the flashcard is not the revision. 
it's using the flashcard that is the revision because that's where we're getting the active recall. Um, and that's the next part that I would like to talk about is when students are using flashcards. And um, often you see them see students using them independently and they'll read the question in the head and they'll flip it over and they go, oh yeah, I was going to say that. And, and of course you're going to say, yeah, I was going to say that. You want to give yourself that sense of success, but were you actually going to say that? If you were to write it down or say it out loud, would that be what you would say or write? So when students are using flashcards, we need to be encouraging them to write their answer down or say it out loud to someone so that, that our brain is actively recalling and processing the answer so that we know, can we actually recall that information? Um, and that we shuffle, shuffle the flashcards up as well. So we're not doing them in the same order every time because we'll just end up being able to remember it in that sequence. So by shuffling them up and, and using them frequently. So you got that right, brilliant. But that doesn't mean that it goes to the bottom of the pile until you start your exams. You know, you've still got to be regularly revisiting the flashcards too. Yeah. It's interesting. I think I guess from what you're saying, I guess the key, one of the key take homes for me is the activity is not in making the flashcards. It's actually ensuring that they are using it and are using it effectively yeah. afterwards. Yeah. I also guess as a parent, it's quite good for parental engagement because I don't need to know the answers. So I can still assist their revision by asking the question and then they can still answer the flashcard in that way. It's not a bad strategy yeah. for parental engagement. And another really fun. useful way as well, which is, is actually going to link to the self quizzing part as well. But when they write their answers down, if they number their flashcards, they can just leave the, the flashcard to the side and they can write an answer down for maybe five or six flashcards and then go back and, and self mark them as well. Um, and, and that's another way of, of writing their answers down and using them to, to self-quiz in effect, which is what I'm going to yeah. talk about soon. Amazing. Uh, lovely whistle-stop tour of flashcards. Let's move on to strategy number two, because this is a flash webinar. Uh, let's talk about mind maps. Now, I know a lot of people are probably familiar with the basics of mind maps. Um, how do you guys use mind maps at Beckford? By keeping them basic. Right. I think that's really important. I think when students think mind maps, they think they've got this sheet of paper and they've got to cover it in information and they've got to get as much writing down. But actually, like I said, with flashcards, it needs to be clear and concise because if we're using this as a resource for revision, yeah. we need to be able to process and read that information quickly and clearly instead of having to decipher through lots of different um, text on there to, to find the knowledge that we're looking for. And yeah. um, so again, with, with mind maps, you're identifying the subtopics and when we're branching them off, we're not filling it with too much writing. We're keeping it clear and concise. Um, and one of the things that when I do this with students, I often do it with them. So we'll do a whole class mind map and I will cold call and I will ask students to um, give me the information that I will put onto the mind map. And then they can use that as a revisions resource then to go home and, for example, color code it and rag rate it. And that will then help them prioritize the knowledge that they focus on. Because one of the things that the first step of identifying knowledge as teachers, sometimes we will direct them to specific topics to focus on. But when they're doing it independently, we want the students to be able to select the topics themselves right. and not go to the ones that they're confident with because they will do because students want to feel that sense of success and they'll go straight to what they feel confident with. Um, but we need to make sure that they're going to those gaps in their knowledge and their areas of weakness, because that's what's going to make the difference. Um, so using mind maps as well as a revision tool to actually make it clear to them of, oh, this is what I'm confident with. This is what I need to go over. This is what I haven't got a clue about and I need to ask my teacher about it. And um, so that's another way of which we encourage using mind maps as a way to prioritize the, the knowledge as well. So it's interesting. So uh, I guess the two things I really want to ask you about mind maps, you touched on one of them is, yeah, most people tend to do the stuff they're good at to make themselves feel better about it. So mm -hmm. it's always interesting about how much do we direct them to, especially just at the start versus mm -hmm. um, as they go on. And the other thing I really wanted to, I guess, ask you was, I don't know if you see this, and this might not be your experience at your school is, I think people often try and make their first draft beautiful. Uh, as well. I always think the first few drafts isn't meant to be aesthetically pleasing with a mind map. It's always meant to be a bit 
bit chaotic while you get it out yeah. of your head and then later you can kind of revise it and make it neater um, yeah do you, have you seen that much at all or is that not being your experience definitely and again it's similar to flashcards we're spending far too much time actually in the the making of it than the using of it yeah. um and and yeah they'll spend so much time making sure that it is precise and and it's similar because we don't want to confuse it with a brain dump because we are wanting to have some level of organization with this whereas the brain dump we're just getting it all out and putting it on paper whereas a mind map we are trying to categorize that information as we're making it within the subtopics um but definitely then looking back and then if you are going to rewrite it up as a neater version and um, i i would not encourage my students to do that because it, the information is there and yeah. if it's if it's got if it's clear and concise and it's not crammed with information anyway, unless it's incredibly messy and to the point where you can't read it, yeah. you know, what what impact is it going to have if you write that neater? If you can already re read it in the first place, why are we doing it again? I think people sometimes, I guess, they don't just give like the appearance of being. Yeah, yeah, and you see that a lot in, in exercise books. Well. Yeah, in exercise books, all these fa these fancy fonts that students yeah. do. And I look at them and I think. I love those, but you know, that's not what the focus is. You know, it looks great. And yes, you're taking pride in your work, but at the end of the day, is the knowledge there? Yeah. And are you using it? Is it fit for purpose? Are you able to use it effectively? And I guess just one more question, if I may, uh, on my maps, how much do you do it as an act of retrieval? So they have to do it from memory. And how much do they do it, you know, with the information next to them? at the early stage when they're first creating their mind maps? I think it depends how far in, a, in of a topic you are, whether you're at the start or the end. Yeah. Um, at the end, it's nice to have that knowledge there to identify the subtopics, but then yeah. be able to branch off those subtopics, what you can remember, and then compare it to a knowledge organiser and maybe check, have you got the right information down? Yeah. And also add things that you've missed in a different colour. And I think that different colour in revision is so important because that is highlighting what you know and what you don't know. Right. And again, you've just produced another resource that is going to help you prioritise the, the knowledge that you need to focus on when you're revising. Um, and that's just from having two coloured pens. And it's incredible how two coloured pens can be so powerful. Yeah. So it's the little things, isn't it? Yeah. Perfect. From my maps, we take a quick jump to self-quizzing. My favourite um, one. <laughs> your favourite one. Okay, so no pressure then to really do it <laughs> justice. Uh, for anyone, let's start with the basics. For anyone unfamiliar with, can you tell us what self-quizzing is, for, for example, compared to a flashcard? Um, so what is it and how do you guys do it? So it's the it's the act of active recall. And with flash, the difference between flashcards is you're designing the flashcards, you're making them and you're using them. Um, and you can use flashcards to self-quiz. Right. Um, but self-quizzing, we are actively recalling answers from a set of questions. And it's where we get those questions from, which I love about this um, revision strategy, because it can be so teacher-led and it can be so student-led and it you can be creative with it. So like all of them, you're identifying the knowledge. And I, I do, if I am, um, if I'm creating the questions or if I'm asking the students to create them themselves, we do make sure that they've got a knowledge organizer there with them because the important thing is that the students know the correct answer and that they are going to be able to find out the correct answer to the question that they're going to be asking themselves. Yeah. And so we would have the knowledge organizer and I would say, right, um, I've created you five questions based on this knowledge organizer or we've done this plenty of times you're going to create yourself five questions based on this knowledge organizer um, and you're going to spend around five to ten minutes reviewing this content and creating yourself questions and um, or I've set you ten questions and then you're going to cover up that information and you're going to answer them and you're going to answer all five in one go. You're not going to answer one and then check. We're going to answer them all. And then we're going to look at that information. We're going to mark our answers. And we're going to use that knowledge organizer or the information to help us mark our answers. And we're going to make any corrections in green. And any answers that we've got completely wrong or questions that we've just not felt confident with, um, I get my students to highlight them. Because when we go back to the self-quizzing again, that question that they've highlighted, that's going to be the first question that they quiz themselves on next time. Because we're not going to ignore an error. 
we start with the errors to start off with and revision. Any errors that we've previously made, we're going to keep revisiting them until that's no longer an error. Um, and when we're self-quizzing, we can do it with flashcards or, um, like I said, we, we create those questions and then you could quiz another person. So you could do it in partners um, and they can write the answers down to your questions. You can write the answers down to their questions. So it can be really interactive as well. But it's this whole process of active recall and students being able to think of the answer on the spot and write down the answer because it's so um, it's what they're going to have to do in their exams. It's it's related to assessments. They're going to get a question and they're going to have to answer it. So we need, they need to be practicing that as much as possible. It's all well and good um, making flashcards and making mind maps, but you're not going to have to produce a mind map in an exam. You're going to have to answer a question, which is why I think often self-quizzing is one of the most effective ways is because it's getting students used to answering questions. And does the format of the question vary? Like, do you guys use multiple choice? Do you, could you do this for essay questions? Or is the whole point that it's meant to be quite short and punchy? What sort um, of questions do you get them doing when they do the self quiz? We, when I do this, we tend to use sort of short and punchy. We don't do multiple choice within self quizzing if it's student if it's student driven. And um, I would give them multiple choice questions, um, but I wouldn't expect them to be creating their own multiple choice questions. But I would be wanting sort of short and punchy questions. Um, so that we can recall questions. It works really well for like one, two, three mark questions. Um, and as the students get older, and when we get into years 10 and 11, actually, I might give the questions, but they might be questions taken straight from an exam paper. And it's the short answer questions, your AO1 style questions that I'm asking students to self quiz on, because then they're actually looking at the format and the way the question is written because it's that's what they're going to see in the exam so that's that's what's important and one i'm going to sneak in a bonus question here regardless of how much time we have left um do you do this replicating exam conditions so you, you mentioned about kind of preparing them for exams or does that is that not the is, that's not the key point or do you build up that or do you, do you not worry about that at all um it depends when we're doing it so I can't monitor whether they're doing the exam conditions if they're doing independently. Um, if we were to do it as like as a bell task and we were to self-quiz in a bell task, that would be in silence. Yeah. Um, but also it's really nice to do it as a partner work where you create 10 questions and then you quiz your partner on the 10 questions and the and their partner quizzes the other person on their 10 questions just to get them. And, and they could say it out loud if they wanted or they could write it down. But that whole act of self-quizzing, it can be done in a number of ways. It can be done in silence. It can be done with a partner. It can be done as a group. And um, sometimes I like to get students all to write a question with an answer and then we'll do hot seat. And they will ask the question. There'll be, so, there'll be someone sat at the front of the classroom and they'll ask a question. That student will answer the question. If they get it right, they stay in the hot seat. If they get it wrong, you swap round. So, you know, there's so many ways and interactively that you can make it um, really fun in the classroom as well, because we want to end students to engage in these strategies, not to turn the nose up at them and roll their eyes and think, oh, God, I don't want to do that. We want to build that positive climate around, around these strategies that we're using. No, so I guess it's almost like the gamification almost of like revision. So it's not this formal stressful thing. It's just yeah. something that you do. Okay, last one. Time to bring us home. Uh, I know brain dumps have become increasingly popular. Uh, yeah. Let's assume people, might be someone on this call, who have never heard what a brain dump is. Uh, again, can you tell us what it is and how you help your students develop their ability to do it? Yeah, so in theory, we are wanting students to write down as much as they can about a particular topic or area in a given amount of time. And the one thing that is really important to consider about brain dumps is, are your students able to do it in the first place? Can you guarantee that everyone in your class, if you ask them to do a brain dump in a class or you ask them to do it at home, are they going to be able to write down a significant amount of information without any prompts to start off with? Because if not, and as a teacher, you think, oh, I don't know whether this child in my class is going to be able to do this. Don't do it because it's going to knock their confidence massively because suddenly they're going to go, oh, my gosh, I don't know anything about this topic. But actually, they do if you were to give them prompts. Um, so, so does that mean just on that note that you 
of all the strategies you build up to brain dumps. Does that mean you do brain dumps? Yeah, I, th I think or, this yeah. is the one that we build up to. And this is what we'd maybe encourage in year 10 and 11. I think it's quite higher order thinking when it comes right. to brain dumps. And it and when, like I said, we did a questionnaire, although this was one of the most effective strategies that students highlighted, it was the lowest one out of the four. Right. And I think that's because it heavily relies on a, on a lot of confidence from the students to having themselves to be able to do it effectively. And um, so you identify the knowledge. So for example, um, you're gonna write down as much as you can about act one, scene one in Romeo and Juliet. Ask me why I'm talking about English because I'm not an English teacher, but it's the first <laughs> thing that came to my mind. Um, and then students would write down as much as they could remember what happened in that scene. Um, and then once we've done that, they would then look and you do it in a time limit. So you've got five minutes to write down as much as you can, because in exams, we don't have um, forever and a day to write our answers. We need to be making sure that we can write quickly and we can recall that information quickly. And um, so you could do this in a classroom setting or students could do it at home on a whiteboard, a sheet of paper. I love doing it on tables. Whiteboard pen and a table rubs off. Kids love it, it engages them. And it is it is one way of, of making brain dumps engaging, but you've got to make sure your students have that knowledge to start with. So once they've written down as much information as they can in a given amount of time, and you might start off with a, a higher amount of time, and over time you decrease it and you make it harder. We then look at, right, what have we written down? Because at the minute, this is just our brain on a sheet of paper. There's no organisation to it. You know, it, it's everything everywhere. So then let's organize it. Let's look at what we've written down. Oh, this information is these four people are the characters that appear in there. So let's highlight all the characters on our brain dump in one particular color. And these are the themes that happen within this, within this plot. Um, so we're gonna highlight the themes in blue and we start to organize the brain dump now and we can actually see, oh, these are the characters that I can identify. These are the themes that I can identify. And then we'll look at our knowledge organizer and we'll look at, what, what does it say happens in Act 1 in Romeo and Juliet? Oh, it's mentioned all these four characters and I've written these down. Brilliant. I can tick these off because I know this is right. But hang on a minute. I've mentioned this person and this person doesn't come up in Act 1. So maybe I need to remember that that person, that, that piece, that character isn't relevant for this topic area. Um, so I, I might cross that one out. And actually, I've missed this bit out. So I'm going to add that. So... It's, it's looking at what do you already know? What can you get down in a sufficient amount of time? But really then looking at what you've written down to organize it and check the understanding of the student's knowledge. Um, and this can be done as a whole class. I love doing it as a whole class um, or in pairs and at home for revision. But I think it's really important that this strategy specifically is modeled as much as you can to students in the classroom before you ask them to do it at home. Because as well, it's in timed conditions and students aren't the ones that are gonna want to put a timer on because if if you are, if they're showing it to the teacher, they kind of wanna make sure they're showing the best work. So it's highly unlikely that they are gonna do it in five minutes. They're probably gonna do it in 15 minutes because they want the teacher to be proud of them. And this is a brilliant piece of work. So it's important that, that, that it's modeled to the students why that time frame is important. And I imagine as well, the more you do it, the less they try to game the system by yeah. Yeah. You're doing 15 because they, they learn that it's the learning is the key part yeah. of the you know, like performance almost. Yeah, and the one thing is with all of these strategies, do not just expect that by giving these students these five instructions, they will be able to do it properly themselves straight away. It's really important that as teachers, we model it. And I think sometimes, um, given the amount of content that teachers have to cover these days, we often worry, oh gosh, I don't have time to do that revision. Yes, you do. It is one of the most important parts of the topic that you are then modeling to the students how to revise it. Um, it's just as important as teaching them new content. Well, that's why I was going to say, so when you reflect, I guess, on all four is mm -hmm. that's, I imagine why you start early, going back to what we said at the yeah. very start is like, it takes time to model and it takes trial and error to work out what's mm -hmm. a good flashcard and yeah. how do we best use brain dumps. And if you're just starting in year 10 and 11, it's, you're firefighting almost, yeah. essentially. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, we tell students you've still got time. But imagine if you started in year seven and that's the culture that we're really trying to build and that we are on the way to building is that it starts in year seven.
it doesn't start when you find you when you get your exam timetable yeah so i always kind of say with this sort of stuff like i'd rather than do this stuff now than mm-hmm. not do this stuff now but in an ideal world i'd prefer them to do it four years ago um, yeah so i guess it, it, it's kind mm-hmm. of that blend and it um, and it comes it comes with as well sorry building those habits around revision um, and that's something else that our tutor time program focuses on is effective study habits, how to create the right environment, how to avoid multitasking and procrastination, because you've got to be able to build those habits. And the longer you work on building those habits, the more effectively you're going to be able to to work. So much so. So I always think I love this sort of stuff and I love the cognitive science that underpins mm-hmm. this. But yeah, I also think if you have your mobile phone next to you and you've got no sleep last night, this stuff is only going to go going to go so far so the whole student the whole habits is is so important isn't it yeah definitely so uh we've had a few people on the chat box ask um about can they get uh like kind of more information on this or a copy of your kind of slides or suggestions and i know you're very very generous especially on social media with what you share so i'm guessing that that's won't be a problem that people will be able to find that if they yeah. can't get in touch. I have previously Actually, shared them, but I will reshare them and I will retweet everything um this evening. Uh, so honestly for me that's the best part of the of the education community of social media mm-hmm. is it's amazing how generous people are. So on behalf of the education community, thank you, I guess, because I yeah. think it's amazing how much you guys share. It's brilliant. Yeah, thank um, you. I hope this I hope really hope that you know even if you've just taken away one thing um, that it's something that's going to benefit the students because at the end of the day we are educators and we we do what we do for students and if we can better the understanding of how students do things that's that's the main thing and um, yeah I hope that it's that it's effective. So on that note, it's getting close to having to say our sad goodbyes uh, from all of us at Inner Drive. Uh, if you'd like any more details about what we do, uh, we do a whole range of stuff on teacher CPD for insets. We do student workshops. Uh, We've recently launched our Teacher CPD Academy, which has modules for all staff and interviews with experts. And we also do a magazine. Um, With regards to the Teacher CPD Academy, uh, if anyone would like a week's free trial, uh, it's usually aimed at people who are in charge of teaching and learning or CPD leads. So if you'd like a free trial uh, and interested in that for your staff, please do get in touch with us. Um, that's pretty much it from me. Um, you did say, Katie, you were going to share some of your resources on Twitter. So for yeah. anyone who doesn't already do so, uh, you can correct a huge error and start following Katie now. <laughs> uh, her Twitter feed is there. Uh, I have loved seeing how much engagement you get from the resources you share. Um, so I guess from all of us in the drive, just a big thank you for what you do and also for tonight's tonight's webinar no thank you and thank you so much to anyone that's given up their evening to to listen to this i do really appreciate it so thank you